Welcome to this interview with Professor Don Garrett, author of Hume, part of the Routledge Philosopher series. In this interview, we'll find out more about the life and philosophy of David Hume, a truly great philosopher, particularly known for his highly influential system of philosophical empiricism. What makes David Hume one of the great philosophers? Greatness, to my mind, is a matter of extraordinary achievements as a result of skill and effort. So to be a great philosopher is just to make extraordinary achievements in the attempt to answer philosophical fundamental questions. One thing I'd like to especially emphasize is um, that Hume provided fundamental frameworks for investigating ethics and epistemology. So where a framework for a field is a, a sort of whole package of a conception of a subject matter with a set of questions uh, that it uh, investigates, a set of principles uh, and methods and distinctions, and a conception of a source of information uh, for answering those questions, um, and to provide a whole coherent framework for investigating a field of philosophy is quite a rare and valuable thing, and Hume does that. What was the biggest influence on the development of his ideas and why? Well, there are many influences um, on his development, but his original idea was um, to uh, extend what he called the experimental method, the empirical scientific method, into moral subjects, by which he means the understanding of human life generally. Um, he thinks of uh, that method as having been employed already in natural science, what he called natural philosophy. Several, what he calls late gentlemen of England, uh, as having begun this process, and he mentions John Locke, Joseph Butler, Francis Hutcheson, uh, among those. Um, not all of the influences on Hume were English, of course. He refers in his correspondence to the importance of understanding Descartes and Malebranche and Bale and Berkeley uh, for understanding his own work. Um, but those are certainly some of the main influences. And, of course, the, the renewed interest in skepticism uh, was a particularly uh, important influence on him as well. Maybe one particularly influential idea was Francis Hutcheson's idea that um, we have a moral sense, a capability for sentiment that provides moral information, just as we have a sense of beauty, aesthetic sentiments that tell us about beauty. Um, and Hume had the idea that that general way of thinking about things could be extended to a kind of sentiment of belief, a feeling of conviction uh, that would serve as a sense of probability for us. And how has his work been influential, and do you think it will continue to be so? From um, the later part of his life to the present, his work's been influential in one way or another. Uh, the common sense, Scottish common sense philosophers like Thomas Reed, uh, and then later Kant, uh, took him primarily as a skeptic who had to be responded to and refuted in some way. Uh, in the 19th century, the utilitarians uh, saw him as a forerunner. Uh, Jeremy Bentham says he took the name Principle of Utility from Hume, who inspired it. Uh, and in the early 20th century, uh, the logical positivists were uh, influenced by Hume, A.J. Eyre in particular, who uh, introduced logical positivism to England, saw uh, Hume as an important figure. Uh, we are now at the point at which a recent survey of professional philosophers um, showed that more of them consider themselves and their work to be Humean in spirit than see themselves as in the spirit of any other philosopher. Aristotle came in second, Kant came in third. Um, so given that philosophy now is as Humean as that, I think that bodes well for the future. Philosophers regard Hume's early work, A Treatise of Human Nature, as one of the most important works in Western philosophy. Yet later in his life, Hume dismissed it. Why do these opinions differ so vastly? Well, he did write it in his 20s, so it was in that sense a, a juvenile work. I think um, he not so much dismissed it as asked that his critics uh, direct their fire at his later works. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is he says that um, uh, there were some negligences of reasoning and uh, even more of expression in the treatise. He also says it was more, uh, the problem with the treatise, which didn't sell well, uh, was more in the 
manner than in the matter, but it was some of both. So um, he certainly realized things in his later works that he hadn't realized um, in the treatise. Um, but he was also concerned about misunderstandings of the treatise. He had lost a job uh, at the University of Edinburgh that he wanted to get uh, as a result of criticisms which he regarded as unfair uh, of the treatise. But the treatise um, is very rich work. It, it has a bold, youthful ambition, which is to provide a foundation for all of the sciences. Uh, and its principle of inclusion for particular topics is roughly, do I have anything interesting to say about this topic? All of his later works have a much more constrained aim uh, and a much narrower principle uh, of selection for topics. Uh, so that there are topics that we wouldn't know Hume's views about if we didn't have the treatise, such as the relation between reason and passion and motivation, or his views about personal identity. But the inquiries are much smoother, um, uh, polished, uh, have much less psychological detail than the treatise. Um, but uh, in order to understand Hume, we have to do both. There are scholars who prefer the inquiry to the treatise. The treatise is my first love, but as I say, one has to read it all. Hume rejected the notion of identity over time, that there cannot be a persisting idea of self. Can you explain what he meant by that? Well, Hume distinguishes between two kinds of identity. Perfect identity through time requires being unchanging and uninterrupted. Imperfect identity, the kind of identity that trees and animals and rivers have, um, allows for change over time, but the, the change has to be, as it were, not jarring, not discontinuous. Um, so it helps if the change is gradual or regular and the parts of the thing are in causal interaction with each other. So Hume denies that the self has perfect identity. There's no simple self that is underlying all of our perceptions or viewing them in some way. Um, the self just is the bundle of perceptions. But he doesn't deny that the self has imperfect identity. It does have the same kind of identity that rivers and trees and animals have. And what do you see as the consequences of this? And what impact did these ideas have the on the development of cognitive science? Hume says the best way to think about the self is to think of it as like a republic. A republic is something that goes on through time. Its individual members, its citizens, come and go. Uh, but in virtue of the causal relations among them, the republic itself endures. Uh, 